All right, we're going to get going here. I think we have some more people arriving. Um, terrible weather out in New York today, so that may have delayed a few as well. But uh, I want to make sure we, um, we have a lot to get through today, so I want to make sure we, we stay on time. Um, my name is Jason Bordoff. Uh, welcome to the start of a new semester here at Columbia School of National Public Affairs. Um, I'm a professor of professional practice here, and I direct the Center on Global Energy Policy, and it's uh, really our pleasure to welcome the International Energy Agency, Alessandro Blasi and Michael Waldron, to present the IEA's World Energy Investment Report, which came out this summer. This is the official release in the United States, the first time it's being presented in the United States. And it's a really important time to be doing it, I think, especially here uh, during uh, the meetings of the international community at the UN in the middle of New York Climate Week to really look at the numbers and look at the data and understand what the outlook is for world energy investment in renewables, which are growing rapidly, also in hydrocarbons, which are growing rapidly, and to understand what those will look like, should look like, uh, if we are uh, to get on track, which we are not today, with meeting long-term decarbonization goals. And what does getting more on track with those goals mean for investments in different parts of the energy sector, which I don't think uh, is often well understood. Um, <clears throat> So with that, uh, let me uh, just quickly say that this event, like all those at the center, is being webcast live, and both the full video and podcast recording will be available on our website and on iTunes in the coming days. For those of you watching online, as well as the people here in the audience, uh, you can ask questions uh, after we hear the presentation of the investment report. Uh, you can also ask questions uh, via Twitter using the hashtag CGEP events and our Twitter handle at ColumbiaU. Energy. So with that, uh, let me uh, uh, introduce uh, Alessandro and Michael. Um, Alessandro is a senior program officer at the IEA. He's been there just under a decade in, in many uh, roles uh, and previously was uh, operating director of the Italian branch of the World Energy Council. Michael is an energy investment analyst at the IEA, has also worked there for about a decade, uh, previously worked in both oil markets and renewable energy markets divisions uh, of the IEA, and prior to being at the IEA, worked at Lehman Brothers as an energy market strategist, has a degree from another international affairs school, SAIS, but we won't hold that against him here uh, at SEPA. Please join me in welcoming Alessandro uh, to present, and then he'll turn it over to Michael. Thank you. So thank you very much, Jason, and thank you to Colombia for hosting us. Big pleasure to be here. And. Uh, as Jesu mentioned, this report has been released uh, just mid-July. It's a report that uh, basically structures around the three main chapters. One is looking at the m how much money are invested in the energy sector across all the different uh, components. One is looking where the money comes from in the energy sector, who is finding ownership of assets. And the third one is, the third chapter is about uh, more specific in-depth area, which we will go through during the presentation. This report comes in the third edition, 2018, and is an idea of our executive director, Dr. Birol, that wanted uh, basically to supplement the two key strengths of the IA with a new product. Basically, we used to be known uh, for statistics, the past, as the backbone of analysis, and medium and long-term outlook. What was missing was something looking at what is happening today and what are the new business model, how the sector is financed, and so on. Uh, it's done by a small team. Me and Mike are um, coordinating of this report, but again, we benefit uh, of the inputs of many colleagues across the agency and uh, the direct involvement and guidance of Dr. Birol. So I would start with uh, some general findings. And general findings is how much money are invested in the global energy sector. And the total is 1.8 trillion, or put in another uh, terms, is about 2% of the global uh, GDP. The first finding we found out is that for the third year in a row, the investment in the energy sector are declining. It happened in 2015, it happened in 2016, and it happened again in 2017. The second message is that in the previous edition, we found out that for the first time in the history, the investment in the power sector overtook 
investment in oil and gas. And in 2017, this trend was confirmed once again. Now, this can be an established trend, can be more zigzag, but in any case, this, in our view, is uh, underscores the rising importance of electricity in our economies. And uh, for the IEA, 2018 has been declared the year of electricity, and we are going to release a major study in the World Energy Outlook series later this year. Actually, keeping the leadership position, but investment in power sector declined in 2017, is about a 5% decline, mainly driven by generation side, while networks, which we consider as the forgotten giant of the energy system, because there is very little attention to networks, but is about a $300 billion investment per year, it continued to increase in, even if marginally. Oil and gas rebounded modestly, where we've seen uh, about 2% of the sector as a whole, so upstream, midstream, and downstream, and we will see more in details in a moment. Why the good news is energy efficiency. For the third year in a row, we have seen energy efficiency backing the trend. So increasing, uh, even if modestly, 3%. Uh, also, the IEA has several times warned that there are clear signs that the improvement in the energy intensity of the global economy are slowing down, which of course is not a good news. Then we have investment in coal supply and uh, renewables in transport, indeed, they both declined significantly. Of course, it's a very different story, and when uh, Mike later will show you also the investment, not only in coal supply, but also in uh, coal power plants, uh, will become even more evident that 2017 has been a bad year for coal. But what worries us is renewables in transport and it. The International Energy Agency has uh, several times raised the point that the success of a renewable in power sector needs to move outside the power sector if we want to take a decarbonize the system, but the numbers doesn't show this at all. As a, a second area, the, which we have looked uh, pretty carefully in the report, is about the ownership of the assets. And uh, what we have seen is that we have a growing role of what we call state-backed energy investment. This is mainly two areas and two reasons. One is uh, upstream. The importance, the relevance of national oil companies within the upstream sector investment has been rising over the last few years. Middle East, Russia, we have seen companies remain more resilient to downturn of oil prices. And the second one is state-owned enterprises, especially in Asia, India, China, Southeast Asia, investing in thermal power. Now, if uh, about 42% is uh, state back, it means that almost 60% of investment are private-led. But uh, still, also in the private-led, uh, we have to consider that uh, a significant share of the investment happens thanks to government policies or regulation. So if we consider the direct ownership plus the private-led investment that happens thanks to government intervention, in reality, about three quarters of the 1.8 trillion total budget is connected with government intervention. And as IA, we do not see this as a good or a bad news. In our view, this emphasizes the critical importance of the right energy policy to steer the global energy system. Now, moving to upstream, Collapse of prices mid-2014, we lost about $350 billion in upstream investment in a couple of years. But what happened since then? We have seen a modest recovery in 2017, and for this year, in our bottom-up analysis, we still see a very modest recovery in total upstream investment. Companies stick to capital discipline, try to keep cost under control, sometimes uh, this is not uh, the case for everyone, but uh, there is an increasing mood of companies when they have uh, excess cash 
to return the money to uh, shareholders, buy back dividends. But when you look at the money trend, in our view, this doesn't tell the entire story about what is happening in oil and gas upstream. And the second part of the story is cost. Now, you are well familiar, the more or less in the oil history, there was a one-to-one -one relation between oil price trend and upstream cost. If oil price goes up, so the upstream cost and the opposite. Now, the, what we have seen since 2016 is uh, since January 2016, I remember um, Professor Bordov speaking a lot in Davos in 2016 about oil prices below $30. Uh, the prices has almost tripled. But what we see is the cost remaining more or less flat. There are many reasons for this, and of course happy to discuss more in detail. Uh, but what we believe is that the painful period through which the industry has gone uh, was a lesson for the industry. And a significant component of the cost deflation we have seen throughout this period is going to stay. Of course, there is a cyclical component, cost of labor, cost of material, which will uh, end up to give uh, upward pressure on cost. But still, we believe it's remarkable to look what level is, how it changes the cost structure of the upstream industry. A second way we have a look at this is about, so are the investments sufficient to meet the demand trends? And this is something that uh, we have repeatedly warned that we believe no. And it's not just looking at the money, it's looking at the amount of resources that has been sanctioned over the last years. The conventional resources sanctions onshore, offshore, all around the world are significantly lower than the level that has been sanctioned in the previous 15 years. And as our executive director said in, uh, in this very country, March, releasing the five-year term outlook, he said that we are seeing a trend that market will, have, will tighten with upward pressure on prices. And as we have seen yesterday, oil prices for the first time since 2014 went above $80. Now, who is the undisputed star of this sector? Is shale, is light I toil, if, uh, um, from the United States. But to what extent is the undisputed star? Now, this is uh, something we found out last week, so it's not in the investment report, but it's to put the thing in, pros in, in, uh, in context. In the history of oil, all the major supply growth, all the most, uh, uh, I would say, successful story came from very different countries, which had a diff different kind of situations, different kind of context. But they had only one thing in common. And this, the thing in common was all this exceptional growth came from the discovery of supergiant fields, very, very generous resources. But when you look what is doing the US light at oil, what we see in our numbers is that in next year, according to our projection, US light at oil will be the largest production increase in the oil history. And of course, this is an extremely remarkable achievement from this country, especially if you consider that this development does not come from discovery of unbelievable resources. This development comes thanks to policies, market, technology, regulation, innovation, progress. But there is also another side about light I toil. There's been a school of thought, a lot of debate, I believe also, especially in this country, but all around the world, trying to address one question, which was, can be light I toil considered a sort of financial bubble? Is light I toil something that has developed only thanks to cheap, very cheap money due to quantitative easing? Well, now we believe it's a combination of different factors. Of course, cheap money matters. Of course, uh, uh, 100 oil prices uh, 
steady 100 oil prices uh, in the first part of decade mattered in trigger technology revolution and so on. But we try to make one step further and we try to say how this second leg of growth of light light oil, which is coming now, is different from the previous one. So we have seen uh, four phases. Number one, startup phase, 2010-2014. In this period, we had four-time increase of investment, spectacular, nine-time increase production, amazing, but this came at the cost of about 200 billion of negative free cash flow from the sector. In other terms, in this period, the companies spent up to $1.8 dollar for each dollar generated. Then came the crisis, 2015-16. In this period, paradoxically, looks like that the financial condition of companies improved, because if you look at the free cash flow negative, it was less negative. But this was an artificial effect of 70% collapse of the investment. What strikes us is, uh, as far as I know, I never saw a sector that has a 70% decline of investment, but production basically remains the same, stalled, cost development, technology progress, and so on. 2017 came back enthusiasm, 60% of investment increase in the sector, oil prices were raising, and production started to rise again. And in 2018, we have s what we see is the sector as a whole is on track to reach positive free cash flow for the first time ever. Now here, it doesn't matter if at the end will be $1 above or $1 below the threshold. What we believe is important is to look at the level of production and the level of investment and you compare back a few years. This means that light at all is in complete safe hands? In our view, no. There are four main areas where the sector needs to continue to develop. Number one, solve uh, above the ground problems, infrastructure, permian is something that you know better than me. Number two, keep an eagle eye on cost. There are evident overeating signs in certain bases with upward pressure on cost inflation. The sector needs to continue to show its ability to offset this. Number three, we believe digitalization is a very promising frontier for oil and gas shale. Not only shale also conventional, but in, in the shale where you have hundreds of wells drilled per day, you have an incredible amount of data generated. How to make the best use of this and apply in the operation can be a bigger cost saver. And number four is that Light Eye Toil made incredible progress, but is not a unique case. What we see in deep water, for instance, in this year, Guyana from us, but also in Gulf of Mexico, Shell Vito or BP, McDog, or in North Sea, or the project sanctioned by Equino. So they need to remain competitive. I would conclude, then passing the floor to Mike, uh, making one reference to about LNG markets. Now, in uh, gas markets are going very well. Gas demand is growing in a very robust way, and even more LNG trade around the world. Many of you might remember, if you took a map of the United States 10 years ago about energy infrastructure, you probably would have found about 40 different uh, signs on the map representing regasification terminal that were planned at that time for the United States. But the thing is, it's changed a lot. Uh, our executive director, Dr. Birol, in 2009, at that time he was the chief economist of the IA, in this place, but also in other parts around the world, he said, pay attention, a silent revolution is happening in the United States, the shale gas. And since then, this revolution, from being very silent, has become very loud with big implication all around the world. So now, if we look at what happened in the United States, light eye oil and shale gas, U.S. is the undisputed leader of the oil and gas markets. But on LNG, when we look at the trend, as we say, the LNG is going very strong, 
Uh, China imports in the first part of the year increased 50% compared to before. And when we look at uh, liquefaction investment in terminals, we had basically a first phase, Qatar, a second phase, Australia, a third phase, United States, which is completing now with projects coming online. And when we take uh, to all these projects all together, what we see is that the market is well supplied, but in few years' time, the market are going to tighten in absence of new LNG capacity coming online. And of course, uh, this could put uh, uh, additional upward pressure on gas prices as well all around the world, which is something that has increased significantly over the last 12, 18 months. With this, I would ask Mike to continue on the presentation, please. Thank you very much, Ali, and uh, thank you for having me. So in the second half of the presentation, I'm going to present to you some trends that we're seeing on investment in the power sector, but also looking at issues related to, to innovation and uh, new technologies. Now, the first slide I'm going to present to you goes back to the earlier argument that Ali was making about the role of governments in driving investments. The role of government ownership is a slide he showed before, and this slide speaks to the role of government policies motivating the investments, whether they're coming from private sources or public sources. So as the role of efficiency and the power sector are growing overall in investment, um, we think that the role of governments are growing. And one of the reasons is because policies are motivating the vast majority of the investments occurring in both sectors. So this pie chart right here shows you, it's a very sort of simplified version of a more complex issue. Um, but basically what it tries to do is, is speak to the main remuneration models for investments in the power sector. So networks, on one hand, are very regulated sector. Most networks investments are based on a regulated rate of return. Power generation is based on revenue models that are a bit more differentiated. So um, in terms of renewables, most of these are motivated by some sort of policies, long-term contracts, whether they happen to be feed-in tariffs or power purchase agreements awarded under tenders, or the role of the tax credits in the US, for example. Um, but we're also finding that the majority of thermal generation, which is being invested in the world, is also based on some sort of regulated business model. So usually a, a long-term contract or regulated pricing. So this is why we like to say that over 95% of power sector investments rely on some sort of regulation or contracts that go beyond short-term wholesale markets, which is just the very small yellow sliver you see there and is mostly from new gas plants in the US, I would say, and then maybe some other places in, in Europe. Um, that is not to say that wholesale markets are not extremely important for the functioning of the power system and delivering power to where and when it's most valued in the system and balancing it efficiently. But what we're seeing in the world is that these out-of-the-market price signals are the ones that are motivating investment in long-life capital-intensive assets. Now, putting together the power sector numbers, the first chart on the left just gives you a snapshot of where we see the major sectors, um, the interplay of the major sectors in terms of power sector investment. Uh, you can see that there was a pretty strong increase from 2007 to 2012. Um, this was because of a lot of new thermal generation being built in emerging markets. The renewables started to scale up, but the costs of renewables were relatively high compared to what they are today. Um, today, the cost of renewables have come down. We were getting a lot more renewables um, for a very similar amount of money than we invested in 2012. So the, inv the deployment keeps going up. And at the same time, the networks, the electricity network, spending on electricity networks has expanded slowly and gradually. So essentially, uh, we like to say that the power sector is becoming more capital intensive. So we're spending all this money in the power sector, but what are we really getting from it? So one of the metrics we would look at to see whether the power sector investment is meeting long-term sustainability goals, so understanding whether or not we're on track to meet the IEA's sustainable development scenario. So what we did is we took the investments that occurred on an annual basis and we turned them into terawatt hours, at least for the low carbon generation portion. Um, and you see that because of the falling costs in solar PV and wind, the increasing deployment, um, particularly in markets with better resources, we're getting more and more energy from these investments over time. Although in 2017, the picture was much more skewed towards solar um, than it is towards wind, which is something which may or may not 
um, hold in 2018. But it's not just solar and wind that provides low carbon electricity, it's other sources such as hydropower, nuclear, other renewables. And what we've seen is the investment in particularly hydropower and nuclear, which are very sort of long lead time, capital intensive projects, which are much larger and require, let's say, more complex project management. Um, investments in these, in energy terms and in dollar terms, are going down. So the total impact on the low carbon generation that we're getting from investments has declined the past two years. To meet long term decarbonization goals, we need that those terawatt hours to be at least as high as demand growth um, so that the share is increasing in the system. Um, but what we found is as demand growth has picked up the last two years, um, the gap has widened between the two, implying that something else, fossil fuel power, is filling in the gap. And it's a message to governments that if they want to meet longer term energy transition goals, they either need to slow demand growth through more energy efficiency investment. Um, they either need to find a way to stimulate more investment in these larger scale forms of low carbon generation or solar PV and wind need to work harder going forward, maybe a combination of the three. We dissected a bit some of the drivers of renewable investment, looking at some of the policy drivers. And this is work or this is a topic that the many different teams at the IEA have looked at in, in various analyses, um, particularly in the, in the renewable market report. Um, but we wanted to look at it from an industry perspective. So the industry keeps telling us that one of the sort of factors that's been important in achieving success in auctions and, and winning auctions is to bring scale to the picture. So everybody has, well, not everybody, but there's kind of a traditional vision of renewables as being very small and community-based and being very democratic. Uh, but at the same time, we're seeing industry players come about who are becoming sort of global forces and are able to bring together very sophisticated project management, contracting, the ability to raise finance at, at lower terms. And we find this as being a success in auctions. So the dots show you the price declines that we see on average in solar PV and wind auctions over a five year period. And then the columns show you the sizes of the projects. So we used project scale as sort of a proxy for this industry maturation. And what we find is that in emerging markets like India, Brazil, Mexico, Argentina, more markets where auctions are being held, the sizes of the projects are getting bigger. And this is helping to facilitate the cost reductions, but it's also the design of the tenders itself, which is helping to facilitate the increased projects. One factor of these is in India, the government helping to arrange land and grid connection in the solar park scheme, which has facilitated larger solar projects. When we look at this phenomenon in Europe, though, we see a different picture. Um, the development of utility scale PV and onshore wind in Europe, at least under auctions, has been much smaller projects. This is due to constraints in Europe as far as land use and um, local acceptance of, of large infrastructure projects. It's also due to the design of the, of the tenders themselves. For example, in Germany, the, the provisions which, which help favor community wind developments. Now, where we have seen scale in Europe, and the chart doesn't do justice to the scale um, just because of the space constraints, is in offshore wind. Um, so we haven't actually seen the sizes of the projects in offshore wind increase over the past few years. Uh, but we have seen the size of the turbines increase, which is enables them to harvest more wind power, and the costs of the financing come down, which is something we analyzed in more depth in the book. And together, these factors have helped drive down pretty significant cost reductions in offshore wind in, in Europe over the past few years. Turning more to the thermal generation side, we've tracked final investment decisions in coal and gas-fired power generation. And in coal, there was a very large amount of FIDs taken from the period of 2010 to 2015. But as environmental aims became more important on the agenda of certain emerging markets, as overcapacity or let's say excess supply emerged in some markets which pushed down utilization rates in part due to slowing demand picture but also in part due to the role of renewables, we've seen FIDs for coal power fall quite dramatically the past two years. This is very much due to China, but it's also due to India and Southeast Asia as well, which are the two other areas which have been major builders of, of coal power. And essentially, if the world is going to meet its climate change goals, what happens in coal power in these three regions is extremely important. That said, the world is still taking FID on 30 gigawatts of unabated coal power every year. Um, so this means the fleet continues to expand, uh, but at a much slower pace than we've seen in the past. In terms of gas-fired generation, 
um, which is also important in IEA scenarios and also important source of flexibility for power systems. Uh, we've also seen the past two years uh, somewhat of a retrenchment in terms of the FIDs. Um, this has to do with lower FIDs that we're seeing in the Middle East and North Africa in particular, where the construction pipeline is relatively saturated, um, but also lower FIDs in, in the U.S. And this picture sort of echoes some of the things we hear in the news about um, large turbine makers like GE, Siemens, et cetera, having difficulty um, with the orders not manifesting themselves. But when you put all these numbers together in terms of the coal and the gas, and then you add in hydropower, nuclear, um, and you, you take this world of large-scale dispatchable generation, the FIDs and all of these things have been shrinking over the years, whereas the FIDs in variable renewable solar PV and wind have been increasing. So it represents a shifting dynamic of the types of capacities that we're, we're adding to the power system um, and with change coming rather rapidly in terms of the, um, the interplay between the two. Now the last few slides I'm going to shift more towards the third chapter of the book which looks at issues related to, to energy innovation and new technologies. Uh, one of the things the IEA has been tracking for many years now is spending on research and development uh, by public sources. We also do tracking of spending on by private sources in the, in the energy investment report. And one of the trends that we've noticed the past few years is that spending on R&D and low carbon technologies has been flat, um, which is not necessarily been good news for supporting initiatives like, like Mission Innovation, which would seek to increase these spending levels. But what we saw in 2017 actually was something quite positive, uh, which is a significant uptick, or at least it looks like on the graph it's a significant uptick in R&D spending. Um, and we we're also pleasantly surprised to see that most of this uptick was, was coming from, from the United States. Um, so there is some progress being made to increase energy R&D, but still it's not enough to meet uh, longer term goals necessary for the energy transition. Another area that we looked at in depth in the report was the role of carbon capture and storage and the risks and investments associated with these. So in IEA scenarios, CCUS is an important technology application needed for decarbonization, um, particularly of the industry sector, which is very difficult to decarbonize. And as Ali showed you earlier, the the investments in renewables in um, transport and heat uh, were very low, actually. And so dealing with emissions in the industry sector requires a, a multi-sort of faceted approach um, from an energy efficiency, but also perhaps a CCUS um, standpoint. Um, and CCUS also figures prominently in IA scenarios in terms of retrofitting coal plants. Um, and if you have a lot of building of unabated coal plants in IEA scenarios, then you will not meet the goals under the sustainable development scenario. So one thing we did this year is we simply looked at what are the potent, what's the potential for investment, and, and indeed the CCUS investment numbers are not in the 2017 numbers that LA showed you because there was no investment in CCUS in, in 2017, uh, otherwise there, there would be some. Um, and we, we looked at the carbon price, which we thought could be uh, necessary or sufficient to stimulate new investment in CCS and to stimulate um, basically low-hanging fruit. A lot of this is investment in, um, in industrial facilities in terms of improving their, their capture. And we find that with a manageable carbon price of up to $40 per ton, um, you can store 450 million tons of CO2 per year. You can incentivize the investments to store that, that CO2. Um, that said, it's certainly not easy to implement carbon pricing on any level in, in many places around the world, but we also cite some other policy measures such as the, tax, the 45Q tax credit in the U.S., uh, which we view as very instrumental to spurring new investment decisions in uh, CCUS. One thing I would add is that this is an issue that IEA is trying to raise the agenda of, and um, uh, Dr. Barol, the IEA Executive Director, along with the UK Minister, Energy Minister, will hold a, a CCUS uh, event at the end of November, and this will feature um, Energy Ministers, Saudi Ministers, CEOs from various oil companies, as well as trying to elevate this, this, type, of agenda, this type of event to the agenda of the COP in December. And then the last substantive slide I'll conclude on is looking at the role of investment in energy startups. So these are investments being taken by established corporations, so oil and gas companies, utilities, transport, ICT companies, um, and looking at how much money they're putting into 
corporate investment, so corporate venture capital or growth equity, into new energy startups. New energy startups could be anything from an EV charging company to some company working on demand response or uh, maybe home connectivity that has an energy, energy component to it. And we actually find that there's been an increase in investment the past few years. These numbers are not in our total investment numbers, but they represent a dynamic of investment uh, that could happen in the years to come. And what we did find in 2016 and 2017, the striking dynamic is that the companies outside the energy sector, so the ICT companies, the information, communication, and technology companies, are actually investing more in energy startups, which speaks to some of the blurring lines between consumers and energy suppliers in the energy system, but it also speaks to the role of digitalization in helping to integrate and, and uh, produce new business models, which have gotten the ITC sector um, interested in the energy sector in, in, in some ways. Um, I, won't, I won't go through all the conclusions, but I will note, because the first four very, very much echo what we discussed already in the presentation, but I would note the last one, which is a, a message from our book, is that when we put the entire picture together and we look at what we think the implications of the energy investments were for 2017, uh, we say they risk being insufficient for meeting both energy security goals and not spurring an acceleration in the technologies needed for the clean energy transition. And, I'm sure we'll discuss the implications of this in the discussion, so now I'll turn it back over to, to Jason. Thank you. We have plenty of time for uh, questions, um, and I'll just ask a couple to get it going and then open it up to everyone here. We have a, a great group of people here. Um, I'm just kind of curious if you could start with the bullet you, you ended on and tell us um, what you think that should look like if we were to invest in a way that both met energy security needs and facilitated the kind of transition we need to uh, the kind of clean energy transition we need. And the reason I ask is because I don't know, talk about the extent to which that picture looks aligned or is in tension with each other. Because there's a lot of focus today on what you said, which is there's an underinvestment cycle, we're gonna see shortages in oil supply, the market's going to be tight. At the same time, the investment picture might, tell me if that's wrong, look very different if we all decided tomorrow that we were getting, you know, we're going to hit two degrees and, and do what it takes to get there. So what kind of, what, what, what should the investment picture look like in your view if we were to achieve both of these goals and, and is that in tension with one another? Yeah, I mean, just from a, just from a number standpoint, um, and we don't show a slide showing the the outlook for investment, which is in various IEA scenarios, but it means we need a lot more investment in renewables. Um, the investment in renewables needs to almost double, I think, between now and 2030 to be in line with the sustainable development scenario. We need a lot more investment in policy coverage in energy efficiency as well, um, in the building sector, in the industry sector, in the, in the transport sector. And we need to continue to build out uh, the electricity grid and make it smart and flexible in a way which facilitates integration of all these things. So, in part, it's, it's an investment question, but it's not just investment that delivers the energy transition or is important for, for energy security. So there's a number of operational considerations, particularly around the flexibility of power systems, and the IEA has an entire work stream on this basis where we're looking at electricity security and how do you transition power systems um, to integrate higher levels and higher shares of variable renewables. Investment is an important component of this, but it's not the only one, actually. There's a lot that needs to be done in terms of uh, regulatory environment, market design, um, the way electricity is priced and sold, to market coupling, and the way the systems are, are operated. So um, I would say there's not necessarily a tension per se, because in the countries in the world where you need a lot of investment, or let's say where the countries in the world where you need a lot of investment, you have the opportunity to spend money on things which are going to deliver both on the energy security and on the energy transition front. But it's a matter of making that decision sooner rather than later because in a country like Indonesia or a country like India, if you're going to build an unabated coal plant, it's going to be there for 35 or 40 years and you're going to have to deal with the financial implications of it running differently than the original business case would Yeah, so suggest. talk about so that. I mean, because you said we are going to see lots of investment in hydrocarbons. You said we need to see lots of investment in hydrocarbons. And then if we're uh, on a path that is aligned, even modestly aligned, with uh, 
the long-term targets in, in the Paris Agreement and elsewhere, th then people start talking about stranded assets, you're investing in these things and, and you're not going to need them down the road, and there's lots of discussion about what that should mean for the valuation of companies. What's your view on that issue? Well, I mean, this is a quite complicated story. I mean, I believe uh, at least uh, there is a big, uh, in my view, there is a big difference between uh, uh, the perception of what the numbers show and the sense that I mean, at least in Europe, the impression from debate media is about a uh, tumultuous energy transition happening. But then we look at the number, and uh, in 2017, we had uh, above average oil demand growth, spectacular growth of gas demand, CO2 emission continuing to rising, and energy intensity improving, slowing down. So this is uh, the starting point. I mean, of course, we are not saying this is good or bad. I mean, uh, we tend to say, believe it's bad for energy transition. But I mean, this is uh, the numbers. So w what is the starting point? Now, it's evident that there is um, an increasing awareness in our view about the need to move out from traditional sources or try to use better, or try to produce in a better way, like, uh, you know, reduce uh, methane emission and so on. Now, one of the disconnection that is included in this last bullet point of conclusion is in certain way linked uh, to the third bullet, which is here, is the third, yes. So our, w one, for instance, we, if we take hydrocarbon and the investment, is uh, when you look at the numbers, what we see is an increasing attitude of companies in trying to move toward the shorter cycle projects. And shorter cycle project for us is not only shale, where the share of investment of the big companies is skyrocketing compared to before, but also trying to produce conventional sources in a much shorter period of time. And uh, of course this is to make better profits, uh, to have a higher return of investment, but there is also uh, an attitude, an increasing attitude to reduce uh, the risk to long, to re reduce the exposure to long-term risk. In the sense that, in a moment that you still, uh, uh, no one is still able to understand to what extent uh, new technologies, electric vehicles and so on, could impact the demand, uh, what we see is companies are trying to do their business, doing it in a profitable way, but uh, to be shorter in time. So, the net result uh, of this story is that we see a, an interesting trend, which is the oil industry, for instance, is something that has always worked long lead time projects. Quite a well predictable trend. You know, our ramp up, plateau, and then it goes down. Now you see an increasing relevance of the combination of one factor, which is long lead time, and another factor, which is a short cycle, including shale, where you have 80% of the production. And of course, uh, this in our view can add an element of uncertainty. But there is no doubt, as I mentioned before, that if you look at, for instance, all demand growth that uh, there's been so far, and how it's projected to continue in the future, that uh, there is a clear need to continue to invest. Without forgetting that every year, we lose a North Sea production, three million barrels per day, for the natural decline of the fields producing. So, not to, to accommodate, uh, so investment are not only needed to accommodate I growth. Uh, I mean, that's an important point down. that's not always well understood, even if we were to stay in place and just continue to produce the amount we're producing today, you'd still need investment to offset decline exactly. rates. Exactly. Um, can you, uh, you brought up shale, and I'm just curious, because there's been so much discussion about the outlook for shale and the extent to which, I th the, your slide showing this would be the first year in which it faced positive free cash flow, I thought was interesting, because there's a lot of discussion about this, uh, economics of the shale <coughs> business model and how much of it was fueled by low-cost capital and exuberance from uh, Wall Street and, um, and, and low interest rates. And so there was an article, op-ed in the New York Times that got a lot of attention a few weeks ago about that. Um, uh, given what you see happening, what's your outlook for the sustainability of, uh, of, of shale? I mean, uh, we believe that, uh, first of all, in terms of projection, taking from the work of uh, our colleagues in Paris, we see that uh, shale production is going to increase at least uh, until uh, mid of the next decade. Of course, it's a very dynamic situation, which is not only 
related to oil prices, which of course matter, but is also because the resource base continue to evolve. So the understanding and the know-how of the resource base they continue to evolve. And this, of course, changes the pitch. Now, looking at the sustainability, uh, of course, as in any relative new business, you have a winner and losers. We already had many casualties in the shale industry throughout all the, let's say, the first decade of production. But I mean, one area we, which we analyzed in details in this report was exactly to try to address this question about rising interest rate. And what we have done is we have navigated a lot throughout all the details disclosed by companies related to shale. And what we have seen is that actually the average interest rate that the shale companies pay to finance their debt is going down. Despite Federal Reserve is rising interest since the end of 2015. Of course, Jason, we are speaking of the sector. In this sector, you have those uh, just uh, above the water, the 25 point basis increase put under the water and collapse, and others that do not feel the pain. But uh, it's interesting to see the, uh, these dynamics because what uh, this show, at least our interpretation, is that financial condition of companies matters much more than increasing interest rate from Federal Reserve. And for those companies, presumably, who are not in a good position financially and go under, uh, that resource is still there, and companies that are better Chapter financially. Chapter 11. Placed, uh, and, um, I'm, I'm curious, in, in, in uh, one thing that in both the discussion of hydrocarbons and the discussion of where renewables in the power sector are going, you both, I think, I think you both noted a similar f factor to consider, which is, we tend to see the, the, the top headline investment dollar numbers. Investment went up, investment went down. And then you see the headlines, renewable investment went down last year, and people say, oh, it's really bad for renewables. You noted how much costs are declining. Mm -hmm. You also noted that costs are declining because service companies got squeezed in this downturn. So when we're trying to understand whether the outlook is bright or not for different pieces of the energy sector, how do you think about that, given that just the top line dollar investment number maybe isn't sufficient? There you go. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's precisely why we try to take the investment numbers and turn them into the energy, um, which, we, which we can do in the power sector. There's also some other metrics which could be interesting in, in looking at the effectiveness of investment in, in, in reducing emissions, et cetera, um, which we, we don't explore all those metrics. We just use a simple one related to energy. We also relate it to the, to the capacity as well. So where we saw some cause for alarm so the renewable investment went down by about 6% last year, which of course on a headline basis seems rather drastic, and, but the deployment itself was rather flat uh, relative to the previous year. So actually you could say that most of this 6% was due to the falling costs, but you have to be able to look at where deployment is happening in the different markets. So a huge amount of this increase in solar PV investment was due to China, which really stimulated, <coughs> overstimulated its market and now is reevaluating its, its policy framework in order to, to give itself a more sort of sustainable deployment path. But this is also something which uh, means solar PV deployment in China could slow this year, or is likely to slow. Although what happens in the rest of the world will have to do with the way module prices evolve, um, where you're going to have some downward pressure uh, on those due to excess capacity in, in manufacturing in China. Um, so it's taking into account sort of these higher level metrics on investment capacity in energy and then coupling it with some good market analysis and some good understanding of the policies. And it's this sort of more subjective understanding which really helps us to understand or make a statement like we did in the, in the, last, uh, in the last bullet. So with the, like you said, the headline numbers are not mm -hmm. sufficient alone. Yeah, in terms of hydrocarbons, I mean, uh, uh, this is something we are trying to emphasize uh, since a couple of years about uh, the, the investment dollar trend gives an overview, but it doesn't say all the entire story. So first of all, we have tried to measure different uh, other different metrics. Uh, so for instance, the $360 billion lost in the period 2014-2016, we calculated that about two-thirds of this decline was actually caused deflation, and one-third was a reduced activity. But we also look at other things. Uh, I mean, for instance, I mentioned before that when we try to understand what is needed to meet uh, demand uh, requirement, 
uh, we look uh, at the amount of resources that are sanctioned. And uh, this is uh, in billion barrels of oil. And this number is pretty depressed uh, compared to the, what we had uh, the 15 year on average before. So basically this means that uh, our oil demand has to slow down, which can be policy effect, price effect, economy effect, so the or a combination of the three. Or we should have a significant increase in, uh, a further increase in the sh light light oil contribution. I mean, another interesting metric that we have looked is also uh, in what assets the upstream investment are going. So, of course, you can look onshore, offshore, shale. But also, you can look from the point of view of greenfield or brownfield. And what we have seen in the last uh, three years is that there's been a huge shift of investment towards brownfield, so already producing assets. And this was uh, a strategy dictated by companies to try to minimize upfront capital expenditure and generate production faster to have cash and to survive a troubled period. But this has a physical limit in the reservoir. So the fact that the greenfield, the share of greenfield investment in 2017 dropped to a 33-34% uh, of the total, which is an historical law, is an alarming sign. Say to this, what we are seeing is a very rapid increase of committed capital spending, so not already materialized in numbers, which is deep water. Deep water is coming back very strongly. But still, a deep water project, if you are extremely good and fortunate, at least you need the three, four years from FID to the first drop, first oil production, and in many cases, you need more years. So uh, with the demand trend going this direction, as we say, the market could tighten even further of what they have done uh, so far in 2018. You said something I thought that was interesting. You, 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 I think you said it was a bad year for coal. And if I remember correctly, coal use went up last year. It was a key reason after three years of flat growth, emissions went yeah. up last year. When I look at the data, I think that's going to be true again this year. Um, you can tell me if that's yeah. wrong. No, I mean, I don't know yet <laughs> about this year. Um, and, uh, I mean, coal, you know, Chinese coal use is, is on track to grow this year right now. Um, so I think we get mixed on a views sometimes on how coal's doing. Coal's a dying fuel, and we're transitioning away rapidly toward gas and renewables. On the other hand, sometimes the data uh, doesn't look uh, as bad as, as, you, as you would think. Just help us understand how, where, how, how is coal doing and where is yeah. it headed? Yeah, I mean, I will, I will say what I mean. Maybe Mike won't elaborate more on the power side. I mean, when I say the coal was a bad year in 2017, is because if you put together the trend in investment in coal supply, and you put uh, together the investment trend in, uh, F in um, new power plants of coal, we had uh, like 35 to $40 billion collapse of the coal sector. We are speaking of investment in this, uh, in the, in this case. Uh, not necessarily, I mean, uh, how it's going in terms of demand. Say this, I mean, uh, I agree with you. I mean, China is going strong, India is going strong on this. But at the same time, which is something Mike has emphasized before, we are seeing uh, increasing pressure from those governments to reduce the coal use. This is not only a matter of, uh, uh, not only, and I would say the main reason is not climate change, is air quality in those countries. Um, but the good news in coal, uh, and Mike uh, can, uh, can tell me if I'm wrong, is that what we are seeing is an increasing deployment of coal-fired power plants which are much more efficient. So the share of subcritical coal-fired power plants, which currently are still the majority, so using the coal very badly, is still very large, but the new ones coming online are much more efficient. Do you want to comment on that? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's right. I mean, the, the FIDs being taken for the coal plants, there, there are still some FIDs being taken for subcritical plants, but they're, uh, they're quite low compared to what they were in the past. Uh, so this is good progress in terms of improving the efficiency of the plants which are being, which are being deployed. Um, just in terms of the kind of outlook for coal or, or, the, or the prospects, I mean, I, I think <coughs> we would try to put it into terms of what is the longer term financing trend for coal power companies, for coal supply companies, et cetera. And, you know, there can be variability in terms of one year based on supply demand d dynamics where the sector is doing relatively better or relatively worse. Um, but, and it's kind of an open question, not, not us saying we, we have the answer, but 
um, more whether there is this secular trend in increasingly constricted capital to the sector from a financing point of view. I was reading this piece from S&P the other day where they were talking about the difficulty of coal supply companies uh, possibly refinancing themselves in the sort of three to five year time frame. Um, and they viewed this as being a sort of longer term secular trend where if you put the sort of global environmental, global climate issues together, which is interested to inve Western investors <coughs> and the local pollution risks, which Ale spoke to, um, I think these risks are still present and still mean that the financing is going to be difficult in the long term, even though, even if there's a good year or two uh, for Chinese coal sector. And I'm, I'm glad you brought up CCUS as well and, and the work the IA is doing on it. We have lots of faculty here who are doing pretty remarkable work in the area of carbon capture and carbon utilization. Uh, the Energy Center has just hired Dr. Julio Friedman to lead a new uh, large research initiative around carbon management. So we think that's an important area to prioritize. You mentioned the 45Q tax credit um, recently passed by Congress uh, providing a $50 a ton tax credit for carbon capture. Um, I'm just curious if you could um, say a word about where you, s I mean, there's no air pollution reason to invest in that kind of technology. You only do that if you're focused on solving the problem of climate change. Where do you see policy action in that regard? And, and what do the economics look like today? How much does something like a $50 a ton, you know, price move the needle? And, or is this much, much more costly right now? Yeah, I mean, uh, basically what the IEA is trying, uh, since the ministerial meeting of last uh, November, when we had the part as a big side event, co-chaired by Dr. Birol and the U.S. Secretary Perry, with many CEOs and as a minister, what we are trying is basically to give a second birth to carbon capture u uh, utilization and storage. I mean, uh, this is a technology that uh, went through quite different phases over the last 15 years. I mean, there's been uh, a moment of big enthusiasm around this, and then in the last year has been basically forgot. Uh, the game changer in our view is the 45Q, in the sense that this is, a, this is a policy is a clear example that you can try to, at least uh, to grab the, the low hanging fruit uh, for carbon capture and storage, and this can have applications, of course, in, uh, in the power sector, but can have application, especially in uh, enhanced oil recovery fields uh, in CO2, that you have a direct application as well as uh, in industrial usage and so on. There are a few countries around the world that are looking at this in, in a quite a serious way. Uh, but let's say this is something that uh, really needs uh, to scale up uh, momentum again. And uh, uh, I mean, just uh, referring to what Mike was saying before, uh, the reason of this uh, big summit we are going to have in Edinburgh, uh, and also including Saudi minister CEOs, as well as uh, the president of COP is to have CCUS coming back into the discussion uh, and uh, in terms of climate target. In our scenario said before, uh, there are two main technologies which in this moment are put aside, CCUS and nuclear. Without uh, these two is uh, pretty difficult to imagine to achieve any target that uh, we have put in terms of uh, goals. And the IEA being all fuel on technology want uh, to put the spotlight on the blind spot area of the energy debate. All right. Um, let's open it up now. Just for those who may have joined late uh, on, on watching online, uh, we're joined by Michael Waldron and Alessandro Blasi from the IEA presenting the, um, the IEA's World Energy Investment 2018 report. You can ask your questions on our hashtag at Twitter, CGEP events, and our Twitter handle at Columbia U Energy. Um, I think we have microphones. Uh, Oh, there's a microphone up here. If people could come up uh, here and briefly introduce yourself and uh, ask questions. Thanks. Yes, hi, good morning. Um, my name is Valid Abkazala. I work for uh, Risk and Change Management, and we manage large capital allocations within oil assets. Uh, my question is about uh, something came out in the news about last week regarding OPEC and Saudi specifically um, collaborating with Russia, trying to get the oil price artificially controlled between 70 and $80 a barrel. Uh, my question regarding that is, how do you see that impacting investment since our break-evens and our economics here in the U.S. for investments are considerably different than the Middle East and Russia, as well as the fact that most of technological advancement that we've had has been through investment in riskier projects that have higher break-even points? Thank you. 
Well, I mean, I'm not going to comment or speculate about uh, speculation on the OPEC-Russia agreement. As this is, uh, I mean, IEA works uh, extremely well with OPEC, and uh, we trust very much what uh, are the OPEC decision uh, around, uh, you know, the different, uh, different area. In terms of investment, I believe it's already evident. I mean, at $80, but even lower, I mean, the investment uh, in shale are the undisputed star in the upstream. In the sense that uh, last year we had by far the investment in uh, shale outpaced in 2017, all the other regions of the world, all other assets. We had uh, about 60% increase. And this year, once again, if you look at the investment trend between different regions and assets, the number one by far was about 20% increase compared to the previous year is the shale. So, of course, you might have a less prolific area where they might have more difficulties, but the vast bulk of potential that is coming online in terms of shale is break-even price well, well below $80 per barrel. So I don't this is the thing. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we, can, uh, we can pass the mic around. I think maybe that'll be easier for folks. Are there other questions people have? There's one here and then two here in the aisle. And maybe we'll take, like, one or two, three, take all three, and then we'll give them a chance to respond. Please. Hi, thanks. Thanks for the presentation. My yes, my my name is Raj Maheshwari with uh, with Char Charleston Capital. I I don't know if this is relevant or not, but I'll ask it. And if you think it's not relevant, please say so. Is it the, the the notion of spare capacity comes up a lot in, in our conversations? Um, who has spare capacity? So, for a moment, eliminating shale. How do you think about, as an example, Saudi, or for that matter, OPEC? And then further, how do you think about Russian spare capacity? Uh, I, I, I know that there are quotas, so I get that, but above and beyond that, and I would like your outlook on spare, uh, spare, uh, spare capacity for the next two, three years, or five years, whatever the number is. And then my follow-up question, which is a big conundrum for me, and I'm not asking you to speculate on, uh, on pr prices. But when we look at the forward curve, and when we see your presentation, or for that matter, anyone else's, it doesn't make any sense. The forward curve is in severe back, back, backwardation, sometimes as large as $10. So what do they know that we don't know? <laughs> There's a lot in that question. So let's take that one first, and then we'll go, we'll go uh, over here. So I take it? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you make difficult questions. <laughs> Difficult to answer diplomatically. Yeah, I mean, as um, what they know that we don't know, I mean, uh, if I tell you that we know everything, it seems arrogant. <laughs> but uh, I, I wouldn't, uh, how can I say, follow the logic of plot or something secret that is driving the markets. I think there is uh, today a lot of attention on what is happening in investment. You have a new source of tracking. Uh, storage, for instance, or movement, uh, satellite data in real time. So I, I tend to believe that the market are more transparent than what we believe. And um, about spare capacity is another difficult question. I mean, of course, uh, traditionally, Saudi is uh, the country having the largest spare capacity. I think in this moment, as far as we understood, uh, the spare capacity is pretty uh, shrink thanks to the increase of production they had recently, decided recently this year. Uh, but still, uh, these are what we have seen during the cycle of uh, investment over the last few years. The national oil companies have continued to invest. Uh, of course, uh, having slowed down like others. So uh, there is a huge potential there. We do not out make any outlook in terms of spare capacity because it would be a bit speculative. But uh, we believe that the bulk remains there. Now, it's also a question what we believe uh, is a spare capacity. If the, the traditional way is uh, something that you can decide in a few days to open the tap and produce in the market. In this sense, uh, uh, I believe that the limited the spare capacity of, uh, the, the Russia has a limited the spare capacity, but at the same time we believe that can go up a few hundred thousand per barrel per day in a quite relatively a short period of time, or at least uh, this is what uh, the Russian minister stated uh, not later than two days ago. Uh, but again, I mean, in terms of outlook, it's difficult to say. Shale could be considered another way of spare capacity in a longer period of time, uh, but again, uh, here 
the potential of spare capacity, especially in Permian, uh, is constrained by evacuation pipeline, evacuation pipeline. Uh, but still, what, for instance, we are seeing in shale is that um, drilling activities have continued, also in the second part of this year, completion activity has slowed down due to constraint in bringing production out. So this anticipates that when the pipeline are in place, you can increase production in quite a relatively short period of time. Not in days, but in quite a relatively short period of time. And it's not only a question of how quickly it can come to market, but how long it can be sustained. So that's an important question as well. Sorry, apologize. When people talk about spare capacity, yeah. there's a question of how quickly it can be brought to market. There's also a question of how long it can yeah. be sustained. You can yeah. surge production, which is different from sustained yeah. spare capacity increases. Yeah. I just, just to make sure I understood your answer to his, his first point about what do they know that, that we don't. Do you, when you look at the futures curve, do you infer from that that the market has a different view than the IEA, that there's not a looming underinvestment cycle coming? No, but I mean, uh, we do not. Uh, we have basically two things. We do two things with three things with prices. First, by law, we do not forecast prices. This is institutional. We cannot do it. So basically, we have two ways to use the prices in our outlook scenario. In the five-year term, we basically take the forward curve and we apply it to our modeling. We do not judge if it's good or bad. We just apply. While the long-term scenario, prices are an exogenous assumption. So basically, is making the model running in order to have a demand to, to find the right price to have demand and supply in, uh, in, uh, in balance. So the level of prices needed to, to sustain investment to have demand and supply in balance. But the key point is IA do not, does not forecast oil prices in the, any of its publication. Okay, thank you. There were uh, two questions here, please. Yeah, good morning. Uh, name is Nazir Bore, I'm with Exxon. My question is all related to the second last bullet on your final slide, where you said uh, you need more private and public sector R&D. Mm -hmm. You showed public sector R&D, you showed private sector R&D in venture capital or in tech companies, but not non-tech company uh, pub private sector R&D. So what has happened to the private sector R&D, number one, and number two, how much more growth is needed in that? You know, is it 50%, is it two times, is it five times, and is it 10 times? And just give us some perspective on yeah. uh, what's needed. I mean, we can, yeah. Yeah. We can both uh, address it a bit. And, and of course, in the book, there's a, there's a graph on, on private sector R&D, and it shows that it's, it's, it's much larger than the public sector R&D. Of course, it's a, it's a bit of a, maybe a different animal, or it's, it's a bit harder sometimes to attribute the private R&D spending to some of the energy sectors that we saw or at least some of the energy sectors that we put in the, in the public sector R&D. I think in the private sector R&D, it's dominated mostly by automotive sector, also oil and gas, um, but some of the other energy sectors in the, in the power sector um, and nuclear grids, et cetera, also have a role. Um, I don't know offhand the numbers where, where it needs to go up to. I, I'd have to consult the book, basically. Um, but I think the private sector R&D has been increasing the past few years, um, but we haven't seen sort of a dramatic surge, basically, and we haven't seen a dramatic surge in the areas, you know, that would be needed for clean energy transition. And one of the things that we've done is we've benchmarked the R&D spending, public and private, in the energy sector and basically say, okay, if you compare this to R&D spending in another industry, like the information technology industry, it's, the energy sector is far smaller. I mean, there's, you just take maybe, the top three or five information technology companies out in the world, and you add up their R&D spending, and it dwarfs what's actually going on in, in energy. So what's really needed is, is a step change in the R&D front. Yeah, and just to supplement one thing, the other reason why we do not show the private R&D is, is also because it's more, I mean, we have calculated this, a bottom-up looking on, you know, I remember it's around 1,500 1, companies. The question is also, it wouldn't be a pure apple-to-apple -apple comparison with the public R&D. For one reason, the public R&D is the one that sometimes take, you know, the most risky projects, the ones that are try to be pursued in order to have a game changer in energy technology and so on. While in the, when you look at the reporting of companies in terms of uh, R&D spending, uh, first, uh, sometimes it's not easy to find out this voice single out, but 
in most of cases is particularly difficult to look uh, what is really R&D and what is like spending uh, for upgrading something or spending for commercialization of a project. Uh, as Mike said, we do not have a precise uh, outlook how much is needed, uh, but what we see is that the share of R&D spending in the energy sector, for instance, if you take as a proportion of revenues, is very small if compared, for instance, and I would add, thanks God, to the pharmaceutical, which is about 10% of the revenues while the, in the energy sector is still a decimal. Please. And then, and then uh, up in the front and then in the back. Hi, uh, Larry Shapiro from the Rockefeller Family Fund. Um, you had said that the second wave of uh, LNG um, facility investment seems to be ending or is about to end, um, yet at least domestically it seems widely believed that there will continue to be quite an expansion in extraction of gas. And I was wondering, I guess the first uh, narrower part of the question it would be, um, do you, is the trend that you are seeing uh, on LNG facilities, do you see that trend uh, uh, that the United States is included in that trend? And then if it is, what's going to happen to all that, uh, all that gas? Now, um, the chart that I showed before is the, that chart tracks the real spending per year of 48 projects as a uh, liquefaction project that has been sanctioned since 2000. The spending just reported just the investment in liquefaction. So for instance, for integrated project, uh, which has also the upstream component, that number is allocated in upstream spending is not on this. Uh, your question is, is, is a very good one. And it depends on which time horizon we are speaking about. So the chart that I show doesn't have any projection. It's just what is the spending now, and of course, some projects that are under construction now will spend some money in the next few years, but it doesn't make any projection. Uh, we expect, uh, at least the US, the production of gas continue to, to grow significantly. Uh, there are you know, some uh, two main sectors where you can have uh, uh, incremental growth of gas. One, the key one in US, Currently, is petrochemical sector, where it's going very well. And the second is power, but here it really depends. Renewables it really depends on your electricity demand growth and so on. Now, in our prospect, in our projection, for instance, uh, up to 2040, we see export of US LNG reaching 160 billion cubic meters. So, meaning that the US is going to be the leader or among the two top leaders in terms of energy supply to the rest of the world. Of course, you need to expand uh, uh, to sanction new projects of uh, export, which is something that uh, we believe is going to come. But as of today, the message of this slide is, uh, for most of the project, uh, you need a certain amount of years to have those entering into operation. And uh, if you do not sanction project now, with the demand growth trend that we are seeing on the international energy market, we might have a tightening of the global market in a few years. In the longer picture, we have, given current condition, we have a few doubts that the new terminal will be built and the more gas will be exported from this country and others around the world. And the only thing I'd add to that, tell me if you agree, is, is the question of sort of does it, are the economics there to see that growth in U.S. gas production. A lot of that U.S. growth in U.S. gas production is coming as a result of the economics of liquids production. This is associated gas yeah. that's coming with the oil, whether we have something to do with it or not. Yeah. Um, there was a question up here, yeah. Thank you. You can hear me. Uh, my name is Henry Geberson from uh, the Carbon Tracker Initiative. And really my question is about the CCS or CCUS and whether or not that will ever work without a price on carbon. It doesn't cost anything to emit carbon. Why do we have to pay to get it out again then? And who will really pay for that? Um, the tax credit that uh, was referred to earlier, I think, well, is, is it 40 or was it 45, 45 that was done yeah. earlier this year. Just reference, uh, uh, there was a little survey done by um, Reuters. They asked 10 of the largest uh, utility plants in the US and only eight of them, sorry, 10, 10, eight out of 10 had no plans 
of utilizing this uh, this uh, tax credit because they simply the uh, price is too high for the investment and the uh, demand is uncertain. Uh, so can we really get anywhere on CCS without a price on carbon? And also then maybe secondly on IE, more specific for IEA, because both uh, the SDS and also the even the beyond two degree scenario are assuming a massive amount of offsets from carbon uh, capture. Um, actually, we, we did a little survey on like back of the envelope calculation. I think we need something like 8,000 uh, industrialized plants uh, to be built over the next uh, 20, 30 years. Today has taken us a couple of decades to build 25. Um, we really need to step up the movement here. When are we starting to say that um, CCS is not the get out of uh, get out of the L card? Yeah, I mean, I, c I can. Start first, and maybe Ali can uh, can answer some points as well. And uh, you know, I'll, I'll caveat by saying I'm not a I'm not a CCS uh, expert, um, but it's it's it is true. And one of the points we make in the book is that uh, CO2 price is, is certainly welcome and needed to stimulate investment in in carbon capture and storage. But it depends. There's CO2 price. There's a lot of uncertainty around that in terms of the variability of it and the, the sort of duration of it. So you need to make sure that you have a, a fixed price of a high enough level over a period of time to incentivize the investments. And sometimes this can be provided through other or better means, through direct incentives, for example. Um, so CO2 price is something that we point to as being one of the important policy instruments here, um, but certainly not the only one. And, uh, and there needs to be a sort of suite of government measures in order to, to stimulate investment in, in CCS, both on the industry side and on the, on the power side, this also needs to be coupled with the necessary incentives or perhaps uh, support for the infrastructure which is associated with that. And then of course there's some geographical or sort of, let's say feasibility aspects of it where you need to be close enough if, if you're using CCS for, for enhanced oil recovery, being close enough to the reservoir, or having the, the, the proper uh, storage sites available. Um, so it's, it's not a really simple deal that's just motivated by a CO2 price, but a CO2 price is something we, we see as very important to facilitating this. And I don't know, Ale, if you have anything. No, I think you cover. I think um, the, I mentioned we hired Julio Friedman a few weeks ago. I thought he wrote one of the better papers I've seen about what the impact of 45Q would be before we hired him this summer. He wrote it for the Energy Futures Initiative, the group Dr. Ernie Moniz started. Um, so I would recommend that to people if they want to read more about that. There was a question in the back, I think. Yeah and then one here on the aisle. Hi, uh, my name's Eric Lee. I'm an energy analyst at Citigroup. Um, again, you know, thanks for, for this uh, very enlightening presentation. It's really great to pull together, all this data together, world view on, on energy investment. Um, and that is why I'm gonna ask sort of a, this might be a difficult question, but with everything you see, um, uh, some macro questions about uh, about investment. Um, you know, you mentioned near the beginning uh, that uh, energy investment in total is somewhere around two percent of GDP. Um, you know, can can you give some perspectives from everything you've looked at as to uh, what might be some of the drivers uh, that help you uh, move that up, right? If if it does need to be higher, you know, how does how does it get to let's say two point one, two point two percent? What kind? What is it in? What is it competing with in terms of investment dollars? And then, kind of a, a related question, which is, um, you mentioned that investment dollars, of course, is not the only way to look at it. Can you shed some light on uh, how you think about the either the efficiency of the capital spending or the returns on it and the performance of it uh, between different types of energy investment? Like, how how do you how might a, an investor choose between investing in a supply gap in oil and gas, as you put it, put it in, in on, on one side? or more investment needed in renewables. Thanks very much. Yeah, maybe this is a, something we can, we can both tackle a bit. And, and to be honest, we haven't fully thought through all the sort of macroeconomic interactions in terms of understanding how we can Im increase um, energy investment as a, as a share of GDP, although it was a few years ago, I believe, that we did say energy investment was around 2.2% of GDP, I think the, the first edition of this investment report that we did. Um, so, I mean, a lot of it boils down to not necessarily an overarching macro view, but what, from the IEA perspective, it really boils down to having the right energy policies, which motivate the investments in the capital-intensive technologies which are needed for energy security and, 
and, uh, and, uh, and energy transition. And the types of assets that need to be invested in in a number of sectors have shifted from assets which are more reliant on or more sort of where the, um, let's say, the, the cost structure is more skewed towards OPEX and CAPEX and now more towards CAPEX um, rather than OPEX. So this really speaks to the notion of having a full suite of government measures and solid regulatory framework which helps to reduce the risks for projects in order to feed into lower cost of capital, um, but also speaks to perhaps some issues that need to be addressed around the supply of finance. And this is an issue where, or this is an area where the IEA hasn't done as much work um, looking at the role of institutional investors, for example, or maybe looking at the role of financial regulations or whether the financial system is set up um, to, to sort of allocate capital in a way which supports more capital intensive assets. Um, but this is something I think we're continuing to explore and work with other institutional partners on. We're also the, the operating agent for a new initiative on clean energy investment in finance under the Clean Energy Ministerial, and this is sort of one of the areas um, that we're going to increasingly look at within that umbrella. Um, maybe one issue on the, on the returns, and this is something we notice when we speak with, with industry players, is that the return structure for oil and gas companies and the things they're investing in is different than the types of returns you get in the electricity sector. And one of the, let's say, I don't want to say barriers, but one of the disincentives to shifting or allocating capital for a company which has been focused on hydrocarbons is they're just not going to get the same returns they are in the electricity sector. And traditionally, the electricity sector has been more of a regulated model where even the parts of it which are really interesting in terms of what's going on in distribution grids and everything, it's really hard to understand whether the types of returns there are going to be equivalent to the types of returns that oil companies can get or even other companies who are outside, operating outside of the energy sector. So actually, the point you're raising, I think, is a really interesting and good one and maybe something that we can explore further in terms of our analysis. And there was a, let's say, a final question here on the aisle and then we'll wrap up. Oh, sorry, there was one in the back. Let's take the last two. Okay. Maybe we'll take them both together and reply and wrap up. Oh, thank you. My name is Maham Masood and I'm a student at the Sustainability Management Program. I just wanted to ask that you talked about coal being, uh, there being less investment in coal over the past one year and how new projects have come down. <coughs> However, countries such as China have kind of, uh, kind of licensed their coal power plants and given them off to emerging economies such as Pakistan and a lot of other economies within Asia as well. So how did you take into account newer coal power plants coming in just from countries such as China into the emerging market? Well, let's take uh, yeah. let's, let's the, this question too and then we'll give you a chance to respond to both. Hi, good morning. Uh, my name is Jean Suas. I work for an international bank financing projects uh, on a non-recourse basis, so project finance. Uh, what we often see in the, in the markets are, are different policy mix. For example, we have uh, uh, wholesale markets, we have long-term PPA contracts, we have regulated uh, projects, and all of those three avenues to uh, drive investments, private capital into our countries, have different benefits uh, and uh, uh, weaknesses. Uh, for example, if you have a country with a wholesale market, it doesn't give stability of revenues to those, em to those energy projects, and therefore, the bankability of those projects may be in, in jeopardy. If you have long-term PPA, for example, through tenders and auctions, you tend to see developers uh, bidding with low energy price, making, once again, those projects' bankability a little bit in challenge. So I'm wondering, from your point of view and from what you have seen in the markets, and maybe if you have been able to compare policy mixes of different countries, if you have come to, uh, come to see um, the right policy mix in, in, in order to drive investments uh, in, in an appropriate way. I understand this, this is extremely difficult, of course. Yeah. Um, I'll answer the, the first question first about the, the coal power plants. Um, in short, we, we do take them into account, actually. In the charts I showed, it shows the total FIDs in, all the, in the countries in the world no matter if it's Chinese companies building outside of China or Chinese companies building in China. But I, I think the trend that you raised uh, is an important one, and as the domestic Chinese market slows, there's still this um, impetus um, from China's perspective for industrial development or this goal of broad strategy um, to make sure that their technologies and their, 
and their um, infrastructure is being used elsewhere in the world. So this is, this is taken into account um, in the analysis, but it, it is something we see as a, as a dynamic, um, although we don't count it explicitly in terms of the dollars. We had a short section on Chinese acquisitions, mergers and acquisitions abroad in the investment reports. You may want to refer to that. Um, your question, I mean, it's, we, could, we could have an entire workshop on, on your, your question. It's, it's really a huge question and one that we are working more with emerging markets um, increasingly under the IEA's Clean Energy Transitions Program. And we, uh, we actually just had a training in Singapore where we did a training with ASEAN policymakers on, on these types of issues. I mean, I, I fully agree with the, all the issues you raised, actually. And I'm, I'm not going to come up here and say, um, what is the right policy mix? Because it depends on too many contextual factors to be able to generalize. So first of all, you have to talk, you have to work with the countries where they are in terms of their market structure. So do they have a fully vertically integrated, is their power system based on a fully vert vertically integrated utility? Is it a single buyer market with independent power producers? Is it um, competitive wholesale market with retail competition? It's probably a shade of gray in between one of those and starting with that sort of market structure and then understanding the different policy and pricing instruments which are available during that, within that market structure to achieve certain aims, whether those aims have to deal with the just getting renewables going in the system or starting to integrate renewables at higher shares, which implies a sort of different approach. So one is which you want to give a lot of in investment certainty to, company, to countries who are sort of at that beginning of the journey of stimulating investment and I'm just focusing on renewables, but you could focus on sort of broader low carbon portfolio or, or flexibility. Um, but as the share of that rises in the system and countries need to think about more integrated planning that looks at both the supply and the demand side. Um, one thing I should say is that, you know, countries looking at um, achieving energy transition goals with the right sort of market framework should be looking first to energy efficiency and investing in this to reduce demand and then trying to decarbonize uh, their supply sector. Um, but the types of pricing instruments that you may need to use um, over time are going to change. So exposure to market prices um, may be very little at the beginning for a renewable power plant. Um, but then the renewable power plants that you put into the system five or 10 years down the line, you may want to expose them more to market pricing. So there's interesting examples of auctions in, in Mexico compared to other places in the world where they're tried to in, in, integrate these uh, more sort of time and locational value of, of generation assets. So I could speak on the issue for a long time, but, uh, but I'll just, I'll leave it at that for, for now. Great, thanks. Well, uh, as I mentioned, the full, <coughs> oh, sorry, is, but there's another question? Okay, we're out of time. Okay. Can we make okay. it, uh, okay. Can we talk about, talk about it offline afterwards? Sure. Is that okay? <laughs> All right. Um, uh, I wanna thank uh, our speakers. As I mentioned, the full video recording of the event will be available uh, on our website in a few days. You can also subscribe to our podcast series to listen to it. Uh, and this is just one of a number of great events we have to sort of kick off the semester. The list is too long to go through. You can look at it on our website. But uh, I think coming up next, uh, we have part of a speaker series on our Energy for Development program. We recently hired Philip Benoit, who used to be at the IEA and at the World Bank. Uh, and he is uh, part of a speaker series on energy and development and security issues in different parts of the world. The first one of those will be on October 9th. Uh, then we'll get the perspective on some of the issues we talked about today from one of the uh, producer uh, companies, uh, Equinor, with their uh, 2018 outlook on October 12th. And then uh, October 17th, we have the IEA joining us again uh, when people talk about where oil demand is headed. Um, uh, and a, a view within that is that petrochemicals will be the strongest driver of that growth. And the IEA has a new report coming out looking deeply at the petrochemical center and what it'll mean for oil, also what it'll mean for gas to the question we talked about here. I think that is an interesting, important topic. So we'll talk about that October 17th. We hope to see you at all of those events. Please join me again in thanking uh, Ali and Michael.